Okay, so welcome everyone. I am Kathleen McMahon, and I'm here today to talk to you about how you can flavor your React components with accessibility seasonings to make your design system delicious. I'm gonna go over this a bit quickly, so let's get some details out of the way. Clicker works, awesome. My slide deck will be posted here after my talk, and I'll also tweet it out. Uh, here are my social links. You can follow me on at resource11 on, um, on Twitter, Instagram, GitHub if you feel like it, and occasionally at Cross Sisters on Instagram. I want to give a quick shout out to our, our sponsors because if they weren't, didn't provide this for us, we wouldn't be here. So thank you sponsors and the organizers for this awesome event. So now here's an outline of what we'll be covering today. <laughs> yes, I have an agenda. So why accessible components, design systems, they are a cookbook, design systems and React. We're gonna talk about icons, buttons, input, and briefly touch upon documentation. So, let's back up so I can introduce myself a little bit better for you. I am the tech lead for the O'Reilly Media Design System, and I race bikes very badly. I face cyclocross. I also try to get more women racing bikes um, by running the Cross Sisters social media campaign. I hand out stickers and buttons, and still, most of you'll find me at the back of the pack racing two laps to your six on a single speed, wearing a costume, because who doesn't love a clown? Well, maybe not this clown. So one thing I forgot to mention is that I am a dev dinosaur. I remember when computers looked like this and software looked like this, and we stored stuff on this and looked things up using these books. Um, this browser was the newest hotness, and this was our stack, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Fast forward to now, and the industry is moving at a blistering fast pace, and you need to quickly get <laughs> adapt to, get, to keep up. And that can be a, a little bit overwhelming, and you can start feeling like <laughs> panicking, panicking Natalie Portman sobbing in the corner. But fear not. <laughs> because we all want to stay relevant. So I propose that dinosaurs are always the hotness. The, those old school HTML, CSS, JavaScript skills are highly valuable and transferable. I love this GIF. No matter which framework you use, those skills give you an edge in the industry where the div has become the reluctant king. So why accessible components and why should we care? Well, our users are diverse and they access our page in many ways. For example, users will use desktops and mobile, but they will also use a screen reader, screen magnification software, mouse and trackpads, standard Braille and Morse code keyboards, straw devices, switch control, voice assistants, think Alexa. Um, the W3C has pro provided these guidelines for us called Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, called WCAG for short. They, um, there are three levels of compliance that we need to meet. Um, there is single A, double A, and triple A. WCAG 2.1 2 double A is the gold standard in the industry right now. Triple A is the holy grail. Um, we also have to follow the four principles of accessibility. Your app needs to be perceivable. Your information on the UI components must be presentable to users and way they can perceive. It needs to be operable. UI components and navigation must be operable. The UI must be understandable, so people need to be able to understand what you're presenting, and the um, content needs to be robust. Users need to be able to access your content in many ways. Easiest way to remember this is to pour yourself some coffee, or some tea. I've been in the mood for tea in the past week or so. So now we have the standards and the principles to follow, and we don't want to leave our users behind, and yet, in February, the WebAIM conducted an accessibility audit of the top automated analysis of the top one million home pages everywhere, and the results were pretty depressing. Here are the results. 97.8% of home pages had a detectable WCAG 2 failures, 97.8. 59% of form inputs, 3.4 million form inputs were unlabeled. 60.1% of those one million pages had ARIA present, and of those pages, 
there were 26.7 more detectable errors on average than home pages that did not use ARIA. Six months later, WebAIM did a reanalysis of those same one million home pages. Who thinks things got better? Crickets. I love everyone here. <laughs> so the amount of ARIA on the pages increased by 4.3%. Yikes. So while developers have good intentions when trying to fix their errors, they actually made the accessibility of those pages worse because they're implementing things incorrectly. Imagine though, if you had accessibility baked into some commonly used components in your design system, wouldn't that be cool? Speaking of which, what is a design system? So I'm gonna paraphrase a quote from this blog post that was uh, brought out by Envision. Um, design system is a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can, be that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. I like to say your design system is a cookbook. And cookbooks have a personality. My mom is a serious fan of cooking, and lately I've been enjoying digging through the cookbooks she's collected over the years to see how recipes evol have evolved over time. So if you take a look at some of the cookbooks published in the 1940s through 60s, and if you can ignore the outdated views on women, um, you'll find some interesting recipes, questionable combinations that included jello and meat. Yes, I went there. And an impressive level of detail paid to every single part of the cooking process. I mean, look at this, level of detail for table settings and entertaining. This is very similar to how a design system works. So what does this have to do with React? Well, there's always been this debate that using a JavaScript framework creates inaccessible apps. Well, if you look at um, React Docs, they have the accessibility page. React fully supports building accessible websites using standard HTML and CSS techniques. So a better way to think of this is to th consider React is, React is a kitchen utensil. It is not the only utensil in your kitchen. You are the cook. In my opinion, it is up to the developer to have that standard HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and accessibility, accessibility knowledge to be able to leverage a utensil correctly, and that includes React. That said, if your developers are unsure how to start building inclusive apps, empower them with your design system. Build more features into your components to help them along the way. So your components are your tried and true recipes, and WCAG is your reference material, and create a component is like following a recipe. First, you start off with your high quality ingredients, that's your semantic HTML, you mix in some seasoning, just a touch at Aria. There's a really good article uh, about Aria's Spackle Not Rebar by Eric Bailey. Links will be in the talk. You follow the directions, that's your documentation, and you read the helpful hints. Those are your best practices. Let's take these principles and apply them to some components. So icons. Icons are a great way to add a bit of flourish to your product. They're used to supplement key messaging and call attention to areas of importance. Icons can be either informative or decorative. If the icon is informative, it needs to be paired with a descriptive text. If the icon is decorative, it needs to be hidden from assistive technology because it doesn't have any significant value. There are many ways to create accessible icons. The two latest versions of hotness are SVGs versus icon fonts. And you'll hear that SVGs is the hottest technique out there, and it's true. Um, we tried, we had all our icons convert to SVGs into a, a <laughs> SVG sprite sheet, and it was glorious. And then we decided to test our apps in VoiceOver on High Sierra, and we discovered a bug. Uh, every single um, group in that SVG sprite sheet would announce, so I was pretty sad. So as a temporary solution, icon fonts it is. So I'm gonna go over an example of how to make an accessible icon component using semantic HTML and the icon font technique. So this is what you typically see as an icon font element in the wild, but it's not accessible. This is an accessible icon pattern in HTML. Let's break it down. First, you start off with a span element and you use a CSS class to attach our icon font family and some baseline styling. You also attach the icon to that span of the icon you want to represent. 
Then, in a sibling span, you pa uh, pass in some, a descriptive icon name to give some more context of what this icon is about. Then, we are going to, on the wrapper span, and I'm using spans here purposely because they are inline elements, and you'll see why later. So, in this um, wrapper span, we added a class to convert the span's native display property of inline to inline block. This way, in the future, we can support margining padding on all four sides of the component rather than just the left or the right of, of a span. Next, we are gonna add to the descriptive text span a class of called visually hidden. This will visually hide the descriptive text from, from the view only, but it will still keep it exposed to screen readers. So this is a high quality component, but there's a problem. If you um, scan this component in a screen reader, it will announce slash F12F email. So that you, those Unicode characters are from announcing from that icon email there. So we need to hide the icon from screen readers, sprinkling, a, sprinkling in just a touch of ARIA. So we added an ARIA attribute here of ARIA hidden and set it to true. That will make sure that um, icon will not announce. And now we are ready to refactor this into a React component. But before we do, let's consider, is this an icon, an informative icon or a decorative one? If the icon is going to be used as an informative icon, no changes, because informative icons need to announce. But if this is a decorative icon, we need to add an additional ARIA hidden attribute to the wrapping span. This way, it will hide this entire element from screen readers. So now that we have an accessible icon pattern, we're gonna pop this into React, convert it to JSX, so class goes to class name, and any empty spans get closed. Looks like HTML, HTML it's not. Everyone here is probably familiar with how it looks like an object and spaghetti underneath, but this makes me happy because JSX looks like HTML. It's just very nice and neat. Um, so let's take this component and make it more flexible. We want to support some incoming props. That projects better up there. My grades are not very grayed out. So we have three props that we're going to support here. Um, the icon hidden prop to control whether we um, show or hide the icon from screen readers, the icon name prop, which will allow us to pass in which icon we want to use in this component, and an icon title prop, which will allow us to pass in descriptive text for this component. The most important part of when you are designing a component is to add guardrails. So it's important to create these because for your, for your components because you want to be sure that the developers are always using accessibility features you've mixed in for them. So for this component, we've added three guardrails. This first guardrail is the icon naming guardrail. So if, the, if um, we are gonna check if the icon name the dev passed into the component is, is, exists in our icon library. So if the icon does not exist in the library, the icon doesn't render at all. The second guardrail that we add here is to make sure that if the developer doesn't pass in the icon title of a descriptive text to this icon, the default name of what the icon is represented in the font is passed in here. The file name is passed in here using regex to, well, the mic just went funky. I'm nice and loud now. Um, so now we have a, a fallback there to make sure that the icon will always announce. The last guardrail we've added here is the icon hidden um, prop. And what we're doing here is we are doing a true or null pattern to make sure that this, if, if the dev passes an icon hidden of true, the re hidden attribute will attach in the DOM to this icon. However, if the developer doesn't pass an icon hidden at all, the re hidden attribute does not attach at all. This true or null pattern is very important for certain attributes that you'll see ones that are like the hidden attribute, the disabled attribute, the re hidden attribute, you'll see them attached to an HTML element or not at all. They don't have a true or false. Because if you pass in false, some older screen readers will still read it out or still hide things. So there, this um, true or null pattern for certain attributes is very important. Let's move on to buttons. Buttons perform an action on the page. They should look and act like a button. If they basically, they're, they're not, if you're going to a different page, use a link. <laughs> Use semantic HTML. Um, you will get screen reader and keyboard functionality for free. You don't have to do div with roll of this or that. Use a button element. It's so much easier. This is the um, high quality ingredients that we start with, uh, the button element. 
And our designer has pa pa um, provided us a button look and feel where our text has proper contrast for all of our interactive states, normal, hover, focus, active, and disabled. And there's color con proper color contrast for text and for the button borders against the background because you also have to have a control color contrast for non-text content as of WCAG 2.1. We've made sure we're, we're leveraging the um, pseudo classes for hover, focus, active, and disable in CSS, because they come for free, let's use them, to give users um, information, visual information on when they can interact with this button. We've also, um, this is the one touch of ARIA we've added to this button, and it's an ARIA label attribute. This is to handle those cases where you have five read more buttons on the page. And if you're accessing this page in a screen meter, what do you know, what are you reading more about? You have no idea. So if you add this ARIA label attribute here, you can pass in some data to read more about dinosaurs. So this is an accessible button in HTML. This is in, in React, class name, accessible button. So if we want to su support icons and button, we pop in that icon component. And if we want to um, position the icon with, uh, with button text, we wrap the children and the icon in a span. This is important because buttons, um, any contents you put in a button needs to be an inline element. It cannot be a block level element that's not valid HTML. Also, you can't nest controls inside a control. So you can't nest less a link inside a button or a button inside a button. You can't, do, it's just not valid. So spans, this is why we made icons a span. So make everything build upon each other and more composable. So now we're gonna add some prop support. I wanna go quickly over this one, which is bye-bye. All right, but we're gonna add some, we're gonna add the click handle support here and disabled button support here and the disabled, but, disabled attribute support will use a true or null pattern because it's the same as what it um, renders in HTML. And then we're gonna add the one guardrail we need here. If someone doesn't pass in the icon name at all, icon doesn't render in the button. Inputs, this is the messiest one. So inputs, they need labels and error messages. Users need context. They need to know what this input is for. And placeholders are not labels. Um, avoid using them as labels. Users will lose context. They're gonna start typing in that input and they're gonna be like, what is this? That's, that's sighted users. Users that can't see, if there's no label attached, has no idea what to do. Placeholders are hard to style across browsers and they're not auto-translated in languages. Also, um, we've made sure that our um, inputs are friendly for anyone that's using screen magnification. So we have a max input of 80, input width of 80 characters. We stack our labels above the input and we put our error messages below the input because if you are using, like say you fire up in the accessibility controls in your, your Mac and you use that, the zoom and you use the picture in picture, it's about a credit card size thing that you were just dragging with your mouse across the screen where you're going. And if your label's here and your error message is over there and because something's wrong with your input, you have no idea where everything is. If you stick it here, it will always render, you'll always be able to have that context if you can't see things very well and you have to zoom in. So this is our accessible <laughs> input component in React. So that's a little hard to read, I'm gonna be kind. Let's zoom in. So let's start off with some semantic HTML. Our input is paired with a label and a span because it needs labels and error messages. We also add a for attribute to the label and an ID attribute to the input to associate the label with the input. We sprinkle a little bit of ARIA in here to handle um, input validation. So the ARIA described by is paired with the error message. The ARIA invalid and ARIA acquired are Boolean props. We are gonna allow screen readers to hear an announcement if something goes wrong with your input and there's an error. So we have used this aria live um, attribute and we set it to polite. We don't want to be assertive and disrupt the flow. We want to set it to polite. And then we convert this to JSX. The um, for attribute is to, can't be used in JavaScript, I mean in um, JSX for this, so we convert that to HTML4 and class to class name. We're gonna add some synthetic event support because this is JSX. We're gonna add an um, on-change handler and an on-key press handler. And then we're gonna do the true, the, um, true or null pattern for the disabled, invalid, and require prop. And if you notice in the ARIA dis described by one, I also did a true or null, well, a, 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 an ID or null 
prop there because we don't want the aria described by um, to show up until it's needed, and this is why. Um, when we, I'll talk about it in the guardrails. So here's a big guardrail for this. If the developer does not pass in a label, the whole input doesn't render. This will encourage developers to pass in labels when they are using your input component. Also, if they don't pass in an icon name, icon will not render. We also do the same thing with our error handling. So if the user does not pass in your invalid function or state and your error message, that whole error message at the bottom will not render at all. So documentation, make it expansive. Be sure to add examples of the many ways a component can be used. Also make it straightforward to contribute to your code base. We use Gatsby, Storybook, and Zite to host our documentation. Uh, what I love about it, especially with Gatsby and Storybook, new Storybook, but with Gatsby, MDX, people can come in and just start updating docs. There's you know, more, less barrier to entry. With Storybook, that's the one I want to talk about just a little bit. Um, it's a great way to sandbox your components. Um, in isolation, you can play with the UI logic without the nonsense of that business logic. And there's one add-on if you use Storybook. And also, as, as an aside, use Storybook 5.2 was just announced, and it's glorious. It also has doc blocks, so check that out when you can. Uh, but the accessibility add-on, it's a must. So here is an example of one of our components. And um, we purposely have something failing in there so to show what goes on here. The um, accessibility add-on is a panel, and it uses DeQ's Axe engine under the hood, which is the same engine that's used in Lighthouse and also used in the Axe Core extension. Uh, Axe Core, which is a part of automated accessibility testing, and also the Axe browser extension that looks through all the WCAG success criteria, scans everything on the page, and will tell you if you have any violations. And if you have violations, it tells you what it is and what you need to do to fix it. This is a great way to identify the low-hanging fruit in your uh, errors to fix in your component and then move on your way. Moving on to helpful hints, provide some helpful hints to your users, give them some more guidance on how to apply each variation of your component. For example, this is some helpful hints on how to do an informative icon, talking about how you could apply it using a custom, custom icon name. You have some descriptions, the code, and the code block. Here's an example for a decorative icon. Also, props tables are hugely important. This way, um, developers can see for their component what, which props are there at a glance, what types they are, and a description of them. And, and you can also put in there whether they're required or not. It's, it's pretty cool. Do's and don'ts. Add do's and don'ts to your components. Help your developers create this is a developer experience thing, which is important, but we also have to remember, this is developer experience, we're, we're thinking about that end user experience here. So this developer do's and don't is helping developer implement something correctly so the end user experience is also awesome. So add some do's and don'ts to your components. So dedicate a page to accessibility resources. Don't force your, your team to hunt and peck for all and go through WCAG and try to figure out all the things to understand all the success criteria. Curate some sources for them to you know, do that heavy lifting so it just makes, it feels like a one-stop shop to develop with inclusion in mind. So to wrap up, our users are diverse. Your design system is a cookbook. Cookbooks have a personality. React is a kitchen utensil. You are the cook. Components are your tried and true recipes. Add helpful hints in every recipe. WCAG is your reference material. And document, document, document. Oh, and dinosaurs are always the hotness. Thank you for your time. <laughs>